This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 8. Conservation Amidst Change Apocalypse Now As long as class society exists, the war on the wild will continue. They are one and the same. The ideal answer to the question posed at the end of the previous chapter, what can we, the weeds, do to defend the wilderness, would be rewild where we are and ourselves to the extent that civilization's false divisions are overgrown. I say ideal because for all the reasons outlined already and more, in most places we are unlikely to see an ecological transcendence. But if the millennium is a myth, apocalypses feel more and more like unfolding realities. Many understandably fear that rainforests could die off in the future thanks to climate change-induced drought. But the fact is that today much of them are already being cleared and burnt to make way for agriculture, still the number one driver of tropical deforestation. Farming has already replaced wilderness on an estimated 40% of the Earth's land surface, so for the animals, insects, peoples and plants it replaced, the apocalypse has already come. Add the overall hijacking of ecosystem services and the continued pillaging of wildlands for animal bodies, tree trunks, water, minerals and anything else that can be turned into natural resource, and industrial civilization is effectively attempting a sustained, blind and hugely damaging takeover of the Earth system. As part of this process, anthropogenic climate change is likely to be a force magnifier. Quote, Habitat destruction includes habitat fragmentation, a particularly problematic factor under climate change, and the problem of alien invasive species so favoured by non-natural disturbance is only greater when climate change is added. The impact of climate change in this heavily fragmented world may be immense, end quote. How immense? No one really knows, though plenty are trying to work it out. While there is a lot of uncertainty on the details, most conservation biologists would probably agree that unless action is rapidly taken, the sixth great extinction event on Earth will be ensured by increasingly fragmented habitat combined with the biological dynamics resulting from climate change. Some voices go further. As Stephen M. Meyer points out in The End of the Wild, extinction rates, long before significant climate change kicks in, are already in the order of 3,000 species a year and rapidly accelerating. The situation is truly dire. Over the next 100 years or so, as many as half of the Earth's species, representing a quarter of the planet's genetic stock, will functionally, if not completely, disappear. Nothing, not national or international laws, global bioreserves, local sustainability schemes, or even wildlands fantasies, can change the current course. The broad path for biological evolution is now set for the next several million years. And in this sense, the extinction crisis, the race to save the composition, structure, and organization of biodiversity as it exists today is over, and we have lost. I don't know about you, but when I read that last sentence for the first time, it was a shock, and it was worth reading more than once. Quote, The extinction crisis, the race to save the composition, structure, and organization of biodiversity as it exists today is over, and we have lost. End quote. Maya's general position is that the Anthropocene undomesticated species are effectively divided into either weedy species or relics, with many of the relic species rapidly becoming, at best, ghosts. Weedy species thrive in continually disturbed human-dominated environments, whilst relic species live on the margins in ever-decreasing numbers and contracting spatial distribution. Relic species do not thrive in human-dominated environments, which now nearly cover the planet. Myers argues that to survive outside of zoos, relics will require our permanent and direct management. Those relics that don't get such conservation attention, and even many that do, will, if not immediately, become extinct, enter the ranks of the ghost species. These species are organisms that will not survive on a planet with billions of people because of their abilities and our choices. They are ghosts because while they seem plentiful today, and may in fact persist for decades, their extinction is certain, apart from a few specimens in zoos or laboratory archived DNA samples. A great many of the plants and animals we perceive as healthy and plentiful today are in fact relics or ghosts. 
This seeming contradiction is explained by the fact that species loss is not a simple linear process. Many decades can pass between the start of the decline and the observable collapse of a population structure, especially where moderate to long-lived life forms are involved. Conservation biologists use the term extinction debt to describe this gap between appearance and reality. In the past century, we have accumulated a vast extinction debt that will be paid in the century ahead. The number of plants and animals will spiral as the extinction debt comes due. Conservation is our government. So what strategies are conservationists coming up with to protect biodiversity, wildness and ecosystem services amidst climate change? The main proposed answer still seems to be protected areas, but with a greater protection for their surrounding matrix and with an eye to flux and increased interventionist management. Of course, putting a park sign on a habitat doesn't automatically result in preservation. In an increasingly crowded world, it's almost a form of advertising. As Maya puts it, quote, bio reserves have become the preferred hunting grounds for poachers and bush meat traders. It is, after all, where the animals are, end quote. While the predation is largely humans eating the wild, it got to the point where the interspecies conflict also flips the other way. In Mumbai, slum dwellers have penetrated so far into the Sanjay Gandhi National Park that some are being routinely eaten by leopards, 10 in June 2004 alone. One angry cat even attacked a city bus. Attempts to overcome such intrinsic civilized human versus wild nature divisions with conservation as development projects, ecotourism, community income generation schemes and the like have had some successes, but not much. Often as not, they have simply monetized existing relationships with the land, bred resentment and instilled another layer of bureaucracy over the heads of local people with marginal conservation gains. More successful, horrible though it is to admit, has been the wide-scale fencing off, including sometimes eviction, of peoples from landscapes, and the continued policing by park rangers. But putting one's ethics aside for the moment, this Yellowstone model seems increasingly unworkable without significant injections of resources, increased militarization, and an expansion of land coverage, none of which seem particularly likely on much of the planet. Both of conservation's big ideas, parks and conservation as development projects, are effectively forms of government over people which presume a static ecology threatened by a human population in flux. On a climate change modified earth where ecosystems are themselves in flux, they always were, but not so rapidly. The obvious answer from a mainstream conservation perspective is expanding out to encompass management slash government over human systems in the landscape matrix around reserves and management slash government of the ecosystems within reserves. Overall, management strategies are likely to have to be more innovative and more interventionist. We already know some of what this will begin to look like. Just look at the incredibly interventionist nature of most of British conservation. The bioregion where I live is, in the context of temperate Europe, biodiverse, but it is heavily managed, in part by conservationists. Given the fragmentation of existing habitat, it would probably be disastrous if such management stopped. Effectively, in my bioregion, it is a ridiculous choice between wild, i.e. self-willed, land and biodiversity. From a radical environmental perspective, not to mention one with an eye to island biogeography, the solution would be rolling back human management of habitat over a large enough area that the ecosystem could function effectively. Realistically, it now looks more probable that much of the world's wilderness will increasingly resemble my bioregion than my bioregion resembles the world's wilderness. There is likely to be plenty of work for those conversation managers with a stomach for the needed endless interfering, but it's not the kind of conversation Aldo Leopold would recognize. Even if such massive expansions of government by conservationists over humanity and protected areas is carried out, doubtful, unless there is a significant slowing of climate change, which I suspect will not happen anytime soon, biodiversity will be affected in ways that will eventually become impossible to manage. A few years back, an old friend and comrade told me, with obvious sadness in his eyes, that the Earth will need active management for the next 1,000 years. 
In some senses, he's probably right. The trick of government has always been that it creates problems to which only it can be the solution. While doubting its efficacy, I, for one, will not condemn those who, motivated by biocentric passion, take this path. However, for those unwilling to step away from their core ethics around liberty, wildness, anarchy, other options remain, narrowing though they are. Damage Control Quote, Action, action of any kind. Let our actions set the finer points of our philosophy. Out of this planet, out of the earth, has emerged a society of warriors, women and men who are planting their spears in the ground and are taking a stand. Our job is damage control. End quote. David Foreman. There are still places and peoples that civilization has not yet conquered, and in these places lines can be drawn and battles joined. Ecological resistance scattered across the planet has been inspiring and often effective. Different people use different priority setting systems to choose where to plant their spears, with the commonest being the simplest, where can I reach and where do I love? For many, the answers to the question of how and where to defend the wild will be obvious, the local agents of destruction clear, communities roused, places to be occupied available, stuff to be destroyed visible. The thing then is simply to act. However, many wild ecosystems and the non-civilized peoples that are part of them have few, if any, allies, and many potential warriors live in places with little wilderness to defend, or with little chance of victory. Given the scale of the attack on the Earth system, Gaia, Mother Earth, some priority setting systems call for increased focus in particular areas. Additionally, strong personal desires to respond to the call of the wild by seeking adventure, escape, struggling communities and conflict also drive people to seek other terrains. Additionally, strong personal desires to respond to the call to the wild by seeking adventure, escape. Struggling communities and conflict also drive people to seek other trains. With the objective of aiding such choices, let's map out some advantages that become clear when we accept that the situation is as bad as it probably is. Given we are in a pretty shitty situation, it seems helpful to transform disadvantages into advantages. Advantage. We are small in number, but the problems are great. The first disadvantage that can be turned around is the simple fact that not that many people are willing to commit to defending the wild. Few are libertarians, and fewer still are able to travel far from home or put time and resources into solidarity action or fundraising. When this is coupled with the scale of the global problem and the number and diversity of battles, an obvious advantage appears. The problems vastly outnumber those of us wishing to engage them for our perspective, and thus we should be able to concentrate on only those battles which most reflect our ethics. We can leave the majority of those messier situations which abound in conservation to when the struggles that don't raise significant contradictions for us are dealt with. This is likely to be never. Advantage. Civilization is genocidal as well as ecocidal. Some indigenous peoples, driven by deeply held land ethics, willingly defend the biodiverse wildland communities they are part of from development. Others are enforcing to do so as rightly or wrongly, states often view them as impediments to progress, or simply want to destroy the habitat to enclose human subjects, other natural resources and territory. Either way, the genocidal nature of civilization ensures that the resistance of minority indigenous communities from the mountains of Orissa to the forests of the Amazon is often an ecosystem's best defense. Solidarity and joint struggle with such peoples is often the most successful strategy for wilderness defense and one that usually involves few compromises and contradictions for biocentric libertarians. Advantage. Conservation budgets in much of the world are tiny. It is not entirely atypical that in just over 25 years, the purchasing power of a forest officer's salary, a graduate post, in the Ugandan Forest Service fell by 99.6%. Such situations enable small amounts of outside money to have a significant impact if carefully targeted. Sea Shepherd has managed to gain influence and strengthen conservation in the Galapagos Islands by providing funds, equipment and technical support to the Park Service, who had previously suffered from both inadvertent neglect and purposeful underfunding to hamstring their chance of interfering with politician-backed mafia-style industrial fishing. 
Rangers in some of the planet's most significant reserves are often badly armed and suffering significant casualties with little outside support. For instance, 158 Congolese rangers have been killed over 10 years defending mountain gorilla habitats and small amounts of money, not least to support bereaved families, is making a real difference to the sustainability of projects and communities. Advantage. A lot of people are racist. Many outside of the West believe all those from it, especially, but not only, those with white skin privilege, possess political slash economic powers they do not have. This illusion, unfortunate as it is from an anti-imperialist perspective, can be of great use. For instance, a prison visit to forest conservationist Roll Zapatos by a handful of eco-anarchists from the British Isles on a solidarity trip in the Philippines, combined with a small amount of international pressure from similar circles, was probably a significant factor leading to his release. Numerous similar examples of successful solidarity in ecologically important areas come to mind. Peoples who have found refuge in wild areas and wish to defend them can use and construct ethnicity and aboriginality myths to both carve out protective land rights, mobilize romantic support from outside, and present a self-protective image whether of peaceful sages or violent savages, depending on utility. Advantage. Non-state forces are also causing ecological destruction. Much destruction and attacks are carried out by forces that though in no way libertarian, are nevertheless outside or adversarial to the particular state that controls the terrain on paper. Conservationists from the uniformly governed West often presume governments control their territory and are flawed if they are not able or willing to act. Rather than strengthening the state as conservationists have often done in some such situations, those who wish to support local communities in militantly defending their ecologies may be able to do so directly, legally, and relatively openly. As the recent experience of Earth First co-founder Bruce Hayes' abortive Green Army in the Central African Republic attests, there can be many pitfalls and problems, but possibilities remain. Even more directly, Sea Shepherd has successfully branded itself as enforcing conservation in international, i.e. largely ungoverned, waters, enabling it to carry out eco-defense which elsewhere, and with less clever branding, would be judged sabotage, theft, harassment and obstruction. Advantage. Globalization is spreading. As part of globalization, an increasing amount of urban social movement anarchists are cropping up in lands claimed by such states as Indonesia, Chile, the Philippines and Russia. Many of these are well placed to engage in ecological resistance and solidarity with indigenous peoples and channel those from elsewhere to support such struggles. Advantage: Habitat fragments may be unable to preserve biodiversity. It's generally accepted that, with climate change, even the best designed protected area system cannot aspire to conserve biological diversity if it consists mostly of isolated units. Myers states above that the wildland fantasies are unlikely to halt biological meltdown. While this is possibly true, the fact that many want to believe they might is, in some places, opening the door to large-scale rewilding, somewhat resembling the wildness regeneration advocated by radical environmentalists for decades. Smaller ecological restoration projects seem to be also on the increase. Advantage. The situation is dire. One can't really make the situation much worse, and one's actions could help make a real difference in struggles to defend wildness and liberty. An obvious criticism of damage control is that it could be seen as treating the symptoms and not the root cause. Diagnosis of the malady is clear, but it would be deluded to believe one had, or more ominously, was, the cure. Whatever the prognosis, the spread of the disease is surely still worth resisting, and if anything, climate change only underlines this. Slowing the destruction of wilderness, what Lovelock describes as the vanishing face of Gaia, may enable the Earth system to better deal with continuing anthropogenic releases of carbon dioxide, a significant percentage of which, it's worth remembering, arise at the moment from deforestation. This is not to say that habitat defences can stop climate change. Like it or not, climate change is probably now the context in which ecological struggles are fought, not a subject against which one can struggle. Nature bats last. In Eastern Europe, an amazing wilderness throngs with elk and wolves. Above the woods and pastures of wormwood forest, eagle owls fly, whilst beavers build dams in the rivers and swamps. 
In what has become effectively one of Europe's largest nature reserves, creepers climb buildings, links run in abandoned fields, and pines have long since broken through much of the tarmac. Welcome to the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone. Following the 1986 nuclear disaster, over 120,000 people were evacuated from the area, most never to return. In the heart of the zone, the previously 50,000 strong city of Pripyat is now deserted, bar a small number of squatters, but is by no means a ghost town. Pripyat began returning to nature as soon as the people left and there was no one to trim and prune the weed. Nature's incredible power to regrow and flourish following disasters is evident, both from previous mass extinctions and from its ability to heal many lands scarred by civilization. Its true power is rarely considered within the sealed, anthropocentric thinking from those that would profit from the present or attempt to plan the future. Yet the functioning of the Earth system is destructive as well as bountiful, and it is not a conscious god with an interest in preserving us or its present arrangement. Yet the functioning of the earth system is destructive as well as bountiful, and it is not a conscious god with an interest in preserving us or its present arrangement, something we may find out if the earth is now moving to a new, much hotter state. With us or without us, while the class war is vicious, there can be only one winner, the wild. In a sense, there is solace in this, but we should not look to such victory as the Christian fundamentalists look to their rapture, for those species that have been pushed to oblivion will not rise from the dead, and neither shall we. Nevertheless, nature bats last. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.